Roger, roger, 595. Roger, roger, 73. All right, well, welcome to chapter five. Uh, this is kind of a, a mishmash uh, chapter for us um, with a lot of different uh, topics, uh, each of which could be a course in college. So we're going to be skimming through the material at a fairly rapid pace. Uh, the other thing is we did this chapter in two sessions last year. We're going to try to do it in one session tonight. So. Um, first, before we get started, are there any questions on material we've covered so far? All right, well, let's get started. Whoop, dip, dip, dip. It's fine. I find my... So I thought I'd start with a nice, calming, pretty picture, but it has a purpose because we're going to be dealing with atomic structure. Um, we're not going to be uh, physicists when we walk out of here, but we need to keep in mind uh, some of the basic uh, conditions that the atom uh, of elements wants to achieve. Uh, that's a, a balance between electrons in the orbits and the protons in the nucleus, and, and also some of the, the ways that atoms like to bond with each other. And if you get a chance to see the Dave Kassler videos, uh, he talks uh, about these, this as well. So the number one thing that uh, an atom of an element wants uh, is to have that equal number of electrons and protons. And it'll go to great lengths to make sure that that you know, continues to, to be that way. Um, and so here we have the conventional ring diagram uh, of an atom. Um, the outer ring electrons, and e electrons orbit around the nucleus at different energy levels, and the outer ring is called the valence ring, and those are the valence electrons. And here we have uh, four in the outer ring, which is a common thing that you will see in semiconductor materials. The other thing to remember is something called the octet rule, is that uh, atoms of elements like to bond together such that there are eight atoms in the outer ring. Now, if it only has four of its own a uh, electrons in the outer ring, well, it can maybe borrow some from an adjacent atom, and we'll, we'll see that here in just a second. So atoms can share electrons in order to acquire eight valence electrons. So maintaining the balance between protons and electrons and finding eight electrons in the outer ring. So hold that thought for just a moment and let's, let's continue. So I found this quotation. The nice thing about standards is that there are so many of them to choose from. Well, we need to be aware of two standards uh, in electronics, uh, the standards of current flow. And back when I first learned electronics in the 1970s, and we were dealing with vacuum tubes, electronics was taught with the electron flow uh, of current, uh, because that better explained vacuum tubes. And the electron flow theory is that electrons flow from the negative terminal of a battery through a load and back to the positive side of a battery. Electrons flow. And that is a true statement. But with the advent of solid state devices, things switched over and we now have the conventional current flow. And we say that current flows from positive to negative. Or another way of saying that is an electric charge moves from positive to negative. Or another way to say that is the opposite of electrons, which Kessler talked about, holes move from positive to negative. So these are the two to keep in mind, the electron theory of current flow and the conventional theory of current flow. Um, and both are true. 
because one is talking about electrons, which move in one direction, and the other is talking about the absence of electrons, or holes, which move in the other. So here's current flow, and you can see the electrons moving, the green uh, electrons moving from right to left. But watch the, the red as it moves away. Those are the holes, and the holes are moving in the opposite direction. So this is why those two um, descriptions can exist at the same time. Uh, Dave Kassler had a nice uh, uh, demonstration using um, egg carton and moving the eggs. And you saw the holes there. So we have conductors of electricity. Those are um, materials that have electrons in the outer ring that are easily moved or easily transported. Um, you have non-conductors or insulators, which uh, are tightly bonded electrons in the outer ring. And then semiconductors, which is the, the point of this first section, uh, which are somewhere in between. So here's a semiconductor atomic matrix. This is silicon. And you notice that as the silicon atoms come together, silicon has four electrons in the valence ring. But as they come together, they start to share. And they share in a matrix, uh, which is the description of a crystal. This is a crystalline matrix. So this is how silicon atoms will come together uh, and, and be uh, assembled for use uh, in electronic applications. Um, here's a, another view uh, of uh, the matrix. And you can see how electrons are being shared. Well, how are they being shared? Well, you got to do something called doping. All right? Hold that thought. <laughs> Anybody know what this is? The, the symbol? That's a Boy Scout merit badge for radio. And you know, radio's been a around for a long time. The Boy Scouts have been you know, promoting radio for quite a while. An early use of semiconductors and radio were crystal radios. Uh, the cat's whisker, anybody ever play with crystal radios? Yeah, so, um, and you put it on top of, um, the, the cat's whisker sits on galena, a galena crystal, um, also known as lead sulfide, also known as lead glance. And um, this is a semiconductor material that when you get it adjusted just right, you, have a, you form a diode junction and you're able to rectify and demodulate amplitude modulated signals. So that's crystal radios, one of the first uses of a semiconductor. For transistors and other more advanced applications, one of the first materials used was germanium. Uh, germanium is still being used uh, for solar panels and some specialty electronics, but I remember I used to repair radios and TVs, and the early radios and TVs that used germanium transistors, they'd go bad over time. They'd get really leaky. And so um, they moved on, and they moved to silicon. And silicon is a much more stable material uh, for making semiconductor devices. Uh, doesn't have the leakage over time issues. And so this is what you'll see um, most of the time. Now, Look in the, on the right-hand side there. See what the, the silicon looks like? Let me go back. See what the germanium looks like? That metallic crystalline appearance. That's what a semiconductor will look like. Um, and I, in my <laughs> careers, used to work for the Dow Corning Corporation many moons ago, back in Midland, Michigan, my hometown. And Dow Corning bought, uh, while I was there, a company called Hemlock Semiconductor which is one of the largest manufacturers of single crystal silicon used in industry. They would uh, bring in sand, they would make polycrystalline silicon, and they would then break it down and make it into single crystal silicon. So just a little aside. So when you get silicon, polycrystalline or single crystal silicon, it's essentially, it's an insulator. It has some conductive properties, but not very much. Well, how do you get current to flow in a semiconductor? Well, we mentioned it before, dope. You have to add an impurity uh, into the matrix 
That's a process called doping. Um, and you do this and you either add an additional electron or you add an additional hole or holes uh, to the matrix. If you're adding additional electrons to a material, uh, that's called n-type. If you're adding additional holes, and I have a diagram here, you'll see it, um, that's called p-type. So pure crystalline silicon is a poor conductor, but when silicon is doped with phosphorus, that's called n-type, that's additional electrons. And when it's doped with boron, that's p-type, additional holes. And p-type holes, n-type electrons, these provide current carrying capability uh, and allow the semiconductor to actually carry a current. An acceptor is a dopant atom that when added to a semiconductor can form a p-type region. An acceptor uh, is something that generates holes. A donor is a type of material that when added causes, uh, has additional electrons, and so a donor um, is, is uh, an n-type material. This is covered in the book, but I just want to reinforce it uh, here. So here's a silicon matrix. And during the doping process, they're adding here uh, indium. And by adding a little bit of indium, you'll notice that the indium bonds with three of four silicon uh, atoms, but there's a, a fourth where it's not bonding, there's a hole there. So would this be n-type or p-type material? If you're adding holes, it's p-type material. So this would be uh, p-type uh, semiconductor material. Diodes are the most common so, uh, semiconductor device used in, in radio electronics. And diodes, or junction diodes, uh, are p-type material put right next to n-type material. And in the book, they go over eight different kinds of diodes. And we're going to talk about them all tonight, because you need to know just a, a little bit about them. Um, but junction diodes allow current to flow in only one direction. And you see um, a pictorial on the top there on the, on the A. There's a schematic diagram there in the middle. You see the arrow symbol. And down below is um, a, a diode, as you might see it, with a, a white stripe on one edge. Uh, the anode is on the left side. The cathode is on the right side. Uh, that's how you describe a, a diode. And current would flow from left to right. DC current would flow from left to right, but be blocked flowing from right to left. That's what a diode does. And interestingly, when you have a P and N material next to each other, there's a small barrier there that you have to overcome. Uh, and that uh, barrier uh, means that after you apply some voltage, and only after you apply some voltage, will current flow. And for uh, silicon diodes, it's at 0.6 or 0.7 volts uh, where current will flow through a diode. And in fact, that's a, a good test. If you've got a diode in a circuit, in a DC circuit, and you want to know is it working or not, well, you can measure the voltage across that diode. If it's a silicon diode, it should be 0.6 to 0.7 volts. If it's not, then it might be open or shorted. If you reverse bias a diode, which is in the lower right-hand corner, if you reverse the polarity, I've said that current will not flow and it in fact enlarges that barrier region uh, inside the diode. So here is a pictorial of uh, current flowing. You're adding voltage uh, to the diode and you're overcoming that barrier in, in the middle so that the current starts to flow uh, erratically at first, but then solidly at the end. You're overcoming that center barrier in the diode by applying voltage to it. That barrier is also called the junction region. When you buy a diode, you buy it for a particular application. Now here we're talking about junction diodes, and they're primarily used in power supplies to convert alternating current to DC current. 
and you'll buy them and they'll have certain specifications which you can look up. And one of those is the peak inverse voltage. And so if you're going to be operating in a 25 volt circuit, well you probably want a peak inverse voltage rating of maybe three to four times that for safety's sake. So you'd want to buy a diode rating of at least 100 volts PIV. You could also buy a 1,000 volt PIV silicon diode and just keep it as a spare. It, there's no detriment to using a higher voltage rated uh, diode in, in a circuit other than uh, cost. So you want to have a PIV uh, rating well in excess of your operating voltage and you want to know what the maximum current through that diode uh, can be. Junction diodes fail because of overheating. They'll let the smoke out. And um, you can calculate if you know what the maximum um, uh, current is uh, of a diode and you know that there's going to be a 0.6 to 0.7 volt drop across that diode, well you can calculate the amount of power that that represents by taking 0.6 times the current rating and you'll say, you'll see, well, okay, that at full um, current load that uh, a diode is going to be uh, dissipating 5 watts. You know, you've got to think about where's that 5 watts going to go? Is it going to turn your circuit board dark? <laughs> or are you going to uh, maybe uh, move it up off the board so there's air that can circulate around it to, to keep it cool? Things you've got to think about. All right, that was number one, the junction diode. Another diode that's used in power supplies and has some advantages is called the Schottky diode. Um, and there, with the junction diode, we had P-type material right next to N-type material. Well, in a Schottky diode, you just have N-type material. And a metal connection is made in, in place of the, the P-type material. It's used in power circuits, and it's, the advantage of it is it has a lower voltage drop, 0.2 volts instead of... 0.6 or 0.7. So uh, a lot of the um, uh, emergency backup uh, power switches you might find your ham shack that has uh, maybe a, an input from your power supply and an input from a battery and when the power goes off in your shack the battery will immediately take over. Well they're using shot key diodes in there to do that. They're very fast switching uh, and they have lower voltage drops so your radio will operate for a uh, longer time at a op you know, normal operating voltage. And this is the schematic diagram of a Schottky diode. And the, the line is replaced with something I kind of think looks like an S. So you can maybe keep that in mind. Number three, a point contact diode. And here we go back to the Galena and the uh, cat's whisker that's sitting on top of it. Um, and these are used, uh, these are low capacitance RF detectors. The 1N34 is the most common type of uh, radio detector diode you can find. And there's a pictorial there in the lower right hand. And, and if you look closely at it, it really looks like a cat's whisker sitting on top of um, a crystal. And, and when you get one, I didn't bring any in, but if you look real close, that's what it looks like. And so this is a point contact diode. It's metal in contact with N-type material, and it's used for RF demodulation. All right, moving on, hot carrier diodes. These are used for UHF and VHF mixers or detectors. It's a type of a Schottky diode, so again, you see the S there. Um, it adds, though, a metal dot to the point where the wire connects to the N-type material. And um, this has very low voltage drop and very fast switching. So these are hot carrier diodes. Zener diodes, we won't go at length into these, but these are used for voltage regulation and they provide a voltage reference. It's a, a, an occasion where you actually will re purposely reverse bias the diode. And it has a breakdown that starts at a probably a very low voltage. That's the voltage rating of the Zener diode. And if you look on the, the diagram on the right, um, as you come over to the left, you can see that kind of flat line. Well, that's the Zener region of this diode. It's maintaining a more or less constant voltage in that region. And that becomes a reference that you can use with a regulator or a regulating transistor um, 
in a power supply. So Zener diodes are voltage references generally for regulated power supplies. And when they first came out, you used to be able to use them in, in circuits directly. Uh, but that practice kind of went away and you, you'd use other helper transistors and things to make uh, the current carrying capability uh, much larger. But Zener diodes are used for voltage reference. And tunnel diodes, even though they're obsolete, we'll talk about them, uh, they're also known as the Asaki diode. They're either germanium or gallium arsenide. Um, they have something called negative resistance or negative differential resistance. This is a diode that when operated in a certain voltage region actually has gain. And with this gain and with the proper feedback, you can make it oscillate. And you can actually have a microwave oscillator with the source not being an active device, but being a diode, which in this case is being operated as an active device. It's very low power, then has to be amplified up to an operating range. It was used early on in microwave systems, but there are other systems that are now much more popular. But just so you know about tunnel diodes. And seven, uh, the variactor diode, these are very common, uh, not only in amateur radio uh, receivers, transmitters, but in your home radios. These are tuning diodes. Remember you saw that barrier region in the junction diode, and if you change the bias on that uh, diode, the, the region would become smaller or become larger? Well, that actually has a capacitance. And you can utilize that capacitance to tune a tuned circuit. And so the variactor diodes are optimized for this function. And so you actually, your tuning knob on your radio might actually be changing a DC voltage, which is then in turn changing a variactor capacitance, which is tuning your radio. So variactor diodes, also known as tuning diodes. And last but not least, pin diodes. The I in pin stands for intrinsic, and that means an undoped region of whatever the semiconductor you're using. So silicon is probably the most common. So you'd have P-type silicon, then an undoped section, and then N-type silicon. Well, one thing you can use with these is they make very good radio frequency switches. They're very fast. There's no mechanics involved. When the uh, diode is forward biased, RF will pass through them like gangbusters. When they're reversed biased, they'll block RF. And so when you're looking to buy a new modern transceiver or amplifier, you'll see advertised pin diode transmit receive switching. This is what they're using. Uh, and it allows the radio to go from transmit to receive silently. So even though you're running 1,000 watts and you're operating CW at 30 words a minute, you can listen in between the dits and the das. These are full QSK, full break-in radios when you're using pin diodes to switch transmit and receive. They're also used for attenuators as well. So here's an interesting um, material, gallium arsenide. We talked about it a little bit. Um, and there's more here that you can read when you get the, the PDF that we'll send in the email. Um, they have less noise than most other types of semiconductor material. Um, they have great gain. Uh, they're used in the manufacturing of uh, light emitting diodes, uh, in radio frequency amplifiers. Gallium arsenide. Great stuff. The military uses it. It's a semiconductor material with great properties. The only problem, it's expensive. Where a wafer of silicon might cost you $5, gallium arsenide costs you $5,000. So look for it in the future. If, if a manufacturing process can be developed, um, then this offers extraordinary opportunities for improvements. In, in semiconductor circuitry. Another gallium uh, compound, gallium nitride, is used in monolithic microwave integrated circuits. Remember these from the general class, MIMICS? Um, MIMICS are 
uh, radio frequency amplifiers on a chip or on a board. Uh, they have characteristics of common input and output impedances, generally 50 ohms. Uh, they um, uh, have standardized gains, so you can pull one out and put another one in, and it'll just work. Uh, mimics are used in a lot of military electronics. They're used in your cell phone uh, for the cell phone manufacturers so that they can uh, use these devices. Um, very fast switching, very good energy efficiency. Um, they're essentially RF amplifiers on a chip or a block. Um, and the, it's interesting, the power for the devices doesn't come in on a power pin. It, they actually provide DC power through the output lead by allowing the RF to go in one direction and the DC power goes in another direction. That's how you power a mimic. But they're, they're standardized input and output impedances. Um, it just makes designing circuits uh, for high frequencies or very high frequencies uh, much easier. Inside the mimic and around the mimic, uh, generally you'll use something called microstrip construction. Uh, it's essentially just a dual layer printed circuit board but the distance between the layers of the printed circuit board are maintained uniform, and the uh, size of the conductors are maintained in a uniform distance so that the impedance on the board stays the same. So this is called microstrip construction as opposed to point-to-point -point wiring, which you know, was used in, in early radio. All right, we've talked about diodes, we've talked a little bit about mimics, transistors. Transistors were those devices that uh, Bell Labs uh, invented and uh, replaced the vacuum tubes. And um, bipolar transistors were the first uh, type of uh, transistors to be developed commercially. Uh, they're low impedance devices, and by that we say that they're current driven. Uh, current has a greater influence through a bipolar transistor than does voltage. Um, and if you remember from the technician in the general class, the bipolar transistors have a base, a collector, an emitter. And we're looking at a, a transistor amplifier here in what they would call the common emitter configuration. You see the E symbol there and it's connected to ground. The emitter is at ground, so this is called a common emitter configuration. You can actually use the transistor in different configurations, but this is probably the most common. Transistor H parameters, also known as hybrid parameters. Um, the gain figure of a transistor can also be called the HFE. H for hybrid, F for forward, E for common emitter configuration. And the beta or is the current gain of a transistor. And so that's one of the specifications when you, you know, look up a transistor type. It will tell you what the beta or the gain of that transistor is. Uh, and it can be the DC gain or it can be the AC gain at a particular frequency. Um, sometimes both are specified. Um, and so with knowing the gain of the transistor, you can calculate what the collector current will be because it's the beta times the, the base current. So beta or HFE, that's, that's the current gain in a common emitter configuration. There's also something called alpha, and generally this uh, is in a common base configuration, which you see in the circuit there, uh, and the alpha is the uh, ratio of the collector current to the emitter current. And since the collector current actually flows through the emitter, the alpha of a transistor is usually less than one. But it's also a gain figure that's used in, in solid state design. Another thing is the um, frequency range of the transmis, uh, transistor. Um, how much gain will it have at a particular frequency? And when the current gain falls to 0 0.707 or 3 dB below a 1 kilohertz reference, that's called the cutoff frequency. And you can have a beta cutoff frequency for the common emitter configuration, or you can have an alpha cutoff frequency for the common base configuration, and they're generally about the same. So when you look again at a transistor type and you look at its specifications, these are some of the specifications that will be given to you there, the cutoff frequencies. 
And when you're setting up a transistor, you have to set up the current through it in order to properly bias it. Uh, and a transistor is essentially p-type, n-type, p-type material or n-type, p-type, n-type material. It's like two diodes put together. And we told you that the voltage across a diode in a silicon diode is going to be 0.6 to 0.7. Well, the same is true with the base emitter junction. Uh, that generally will, will have a 0.6 to 0.7 volt reading in a normally operating transistor amplifier. That also is a clue in troubleshooting. If you put your voltmeter across the base emitter junction and don't see 0.6 or 0.7, that might tell you something. All right, that was bipolar transistors. We could have spent just tons more time on that, but not tonight. Field effect transistors. Field effect transistors are higher impedance devices than bipolar transistors. And so we say that field effect transistors are more voltage driven. Voltage affects them more than, than current. And a, a three uh, terminal FET has a source, a gate, and a drain. The gate is the input, um, and um, the source and drain are the, the outputs and, and the grounding point here. And junction field effect transistors are the simplest type of FETs. Uh, and if you look at the arrow, uh, the arrow points to the N type material. So on the left, that would be an N channel field effect transistor. On the right, that would be a P channel field effect transistor. And you can make both, depending on the circuit polarities that, that you're working with. Metal oxide silicon field effect transistors. Um, there are two different types of these. There are um, enhancement mode uh, field effect transistors where the device normally has no current flowing between the drain and the source unless you add a voltage to the gate. So these are turned off unless you add voltage. That's enhancement mode. And then the opposite type, which is called depletion mode, which normally is on unless you add voltage, and then you'll kind of squeeze off the current flow. So just be aware of the enhancement types and depletion types. And here are some schematic symbols. Uh, depletion, um, I like to think of the letter D. It's got the straight line on uh, the letter D. Well, if you see a straight line in a MOSFET, that means that it's a depletion type. The letter E for enhancement has got spaces between uh, the horizontal parts of the letter E. Well, if you look where the spaces are over there on the right, that's an enhancement type of MOSFET. So that's how you can tell in a schematic diagram. And again, the arrow will point to the N material. So if there's N type material in the center part, that's an N channel. And on some MOSFETs, they include static protection by actually building in two Zener diodes back to back. And what will happen there is if the voltage on the gate goes above a certain voltage level, the Zeners will short it out to ground and protect the device from destroying itself. So your radio, your transceiver on the receive side probably has a MOSFET as the first active device. And that's the device that's going to be most impacted by nearby lightning strikes. So this is, provides some protection against nearby static discharge. All right, we made it through the first section. Let's answer some questions. So what is microstrip? D, precision printed circuit conductors above a ground plane to provide a constant impedance. And in what application is gallium arsenide used as a semiconductor material in preference to germanium or silicon? At the highest frequencies, you need the highest performance devices, so yeah, microwave frequencies. And which of the following semiconductor materials contains excess free electrons? 
electrons, n-type material. And why does a p-n junction diode not conduct current when reversed biased? Holes in the p-type material and electrons in the n-type material are separated by the applied voltage widening the depletion region. That center barrier is called the depletion region. And when you reverse bias, you widen that out. So what is the name given to an impurity atom that adds holes? A holes, so that's an acceptor. Think about it from the point of view of electrons. If you're adding holes, you're accepting electrons. So acceptor adds holes. And what is the alpha of a bipolar junction transistor? The alpha, you're, you're looking at the collector current and how it changes versus the emitter current. And I said it's normally going to be less than one because collector current uh, is added into the emitter current. So. And what is the beta of a bipolar junction transistor? This is in a common emitter configuration, so it's the change in collector current with respect to the change in base current. And which of the following indicates that a silicon NPN junction transistor is biased on? Look closely. Get your units right. Delta. The base to emitter voltage is approximately 0.6 to 0.7. That's a troubleshooting step. And what term indicates the frequency at which the grounded base current gain of a transistor has decreased to 0.7 of the gain uh, obtainable at 1 kilohertz? So it's a grounded base configuration. So in a grounded base, we're talking about the alpha cutoff frequency. And what is a depletion mode FET? Depletion mode. It is A, but I just want to make sure you got it. Okay, an FET that exhibits a current flow between source and drain when no gate voltage is applied. Okay. All right, get out your glasses. Look close here. On this, uh, which is the schematic symbol for an N-channel dual gate MOSFET? So number one, I said the arrow points to what? points to the N channel, okay? And we need how many gates? Two, all right? So we need an N channel with two gates. So that's going to be number four, which will be B. You see how we got there? The arrow is pointing at the N channel material, and there are gate one, and gate two, that's a dual gate MOSFET. All right, let's try it again. What is the schematic symbol for a P-channel junction FET? So it's away from the line, so the line is now P-channel, so it's number one, it's a single gate on a junction FET. So why do many MOSFET devices have internally connected Zener diodes? Static discharge protection, so that would be delta. And how does DC input impedance at the gate of a field effect transistor compare with the DC input impedance of a bipolar transistor? An FET has high input impedance, a bipolar transistor has low input impedance. And which semiconductor materials contain excess holes? Holes are P-type material, or in this case B. And what are the majority charge carriers in N-type semiconductor material? 
N type? Electrons. And what are the names of the three terminals of a field effect transistor? Field effect transistor. Delta, gate, drain, and source. And what is the most useful characteristic of a Zener diode? They're used for references, so you want to have them somehow have, exhibit a constant voltage. Uh, so a constant voltage drop under certain conditions of varying current. And what is an important characteristic of a Schottky diode as compared to an ordinary silicon diode when it's used as a power supply rectifier? Remember, silicon diodes have a voltage drop of 0.6 to 0.7. Schottky diodes, 0.2. So less forward voltage drop. <coughs> and what special type of diode is capable of both amplification and oscillation? That's the Asaki or tunnel diode. That's where it's got a negative resistance characteristic. Very unique device. It's also obsolete. And what type of semiconductor device is designed for use as a voltage controlled capacitor? That's the variactor, the tuning diode. And what characteristic of a pin diode makes it useful as an RF switch or attenuator? Did I hear B? D. D is in dog, yes. That large region of intrinsic material that provides a good block or attenuation for RF. And which of the following is a common use of a hot carrier diode? That's a VHF UHF mixer or detector. And what is the failure mechanism when a junction diode fails due to excessive current? You let the smoke out through excessive junction temperature. And which of the following describes a type of semiconductor diode? A metal semiconductor junction is one type, a shot key type. And what is a common use for point contact diodes? The 1N34, that's an RF detector, the most common RF detector diode. And what is used to control the attenuation of RF signals by a pin diode? The bias, the bias is what is used, either forward or reverse or somewhere in between. And what is one common use for pin diodes? Transmit, receive, RF, switch, pin diodes, instead of relays. And which of the following materials is likely to provide the highest frequency of operation when used in mimics? Remember the gallium compounds? They operate much better at higher frequencies, so yeah, gallium nitride. And what is the most common input and output impedance of mimics? 50 ohms. And what characteristics of the mimic make it popular? D is in dog, all of those. Controlled gain, low noise figure, input and output impedance constant. Yeah, helps out the designer's job immensely. And which of the following is typically used to construct a mimic-based microwave amplifier? What kind of construction? Microstrip construction. That's where you use the dual layer circuit board, constant impedance. And how is voltage from a power supply normally furnished to the most common type of mimics? Through the output lead, either through an RF choke or maybe a resistor. So the amplifier output lead is where you power it. 
All right. Display devices. This is a short section, and then we'll take a break. Light emitting diodes. I was floored when I discovered that light emitting diodes were in, uh, discovered in 1927. Hokey smokes. Yeah, uh, I think it was a Russian, uh, but um, they were actually not uh, popularized until around 1962. And um, all diodes will give off photons, even you know power supply diodes, but they're in black cases, so you don't see it. But these are optimized for emitting light, and light of a very uh, specific color um, and uh, intensity. So light emitting diodes um, are, when they're forward biased, they'll give off light. And something that Dave Kassler mentioned is that um, LEDs have no current limiting within them. So if you hook them directly up to a power supply, you will immediately burn them out. You have to add a resistor to limit the current flow through an LED. But by changing the value of that resistor, you can change the LED's brightness as well. So an LED, when forward biased, gives off light. Charge couple devices are used in digital cameras. Uh, and they uh, sample the analog signal, light in this case, and pass it in stages from the input uh, to the output of its, the device. And um, you can actually, now this is from Banggood. Here's uh, a lens and a charge coupled device, which you can have uh, output an NTSC or a PAL video signal, 20 bucks. <laughs> the things you can you know, fool around with these days. So that's a charge coupled device. Uh, that's what they're useful for. Liquid crystal displays, I got mine right here on my, uh, my wrist, used for uh, digital watches, uh, for displays in automobiles. Um, they'll turn opaque when the voltage is applied to them, and so they're driven in a certain pattern, and you can get the, the time. But they're hard to see when using polarized filters. So if you've ever had one of these and you've got your sunglasses on and your sunglasses are polarized, sometimes you can't read it. Or sometimes you can't read the, the console in your car because uh, LCDs are already using polarizing filters and it, it makes it difficult to, to use. Oh, let's answer some questions. So in this figure, what is the schematic symbol for a light emitting diode? What do you think? That would be number five, or B as in boy, with the arrows coming off of the diode. Those arrows represent photons coming from the, the diode. And what type of bias is required for an LED? In order to emit light, it's got to be forward biased. And which of the following is true of a charge coupled device? It samples an analog signal, light, and passes it in stages from the input to the output of the device. And what is a liquid crystal display? B is in boy, uses a crystalline liquid with polarizing filters. And which of the following is true of LCD displays? If you've got your sunglasses on, they may be hard to look at. All right, we're on time. Let's take 10 minutes. All right, I, I have to say, you know, maybe in, by way of apology, digital electronics or digital logic is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, man, that was something that took me at least a semester to, to figure out what the heck is going on. <laughs> so if you are confused, don't worry about it. That's a natural reaction. We're going to try to get you through that uh, tonight and give you the information that you need. One thing you will have to do is take a look at uh, some of the truth tables that are in the book and try to understand them as best as possible. We'll talk about some of that tonight. So 
we're talking about digital logic control circuits when we're going to be talking about stuff tonight. Um, and think about that as the things that control the vending machines, that counts the coins as you put them in. Now it's done by microprocessor, but back in the day it was done by digital logic circuits and it still could be implemented in that way. If this and this and this occur, then something else will occur. Um, so that's what we're talking about. And analog versus digital signals, analog you know, has, can have various voltage states um, and, and points in between. Digital signals have generally just two states, a voltage that represents a one and a voltage that represents a zero. And these binary conditions are used by the digital circuits in order to make decisions. So we have to uh, credit uh, Georges Boulle for Boolean algebra. Uh, it's a, an algebraic system uh, that deals with truth or falsity. A one or zero uh, was used to, to represent those states. Uh, and it's fundamental to the understanding of digital electronics. But the thing is that he, he worked this all out well before <laughs> digital electronics was even thought of. Uh, and it's a complete um, uh, mathematical system that uses the same kind of axioms that you know, normal algebra would use, the identity function, the complementary, the communicative, the distributive. You might remember these from high school, very long time ago for me anyway. But anyway, all, all of these things exist in Boolean uh, mathematics. One thing you need to be sure of is what kind of logic are you talking about? And there is positive logic and there's negative logic. Positive logic defines a high voltage as being a condition one. Negative logic defines a low voltage as being a condition one. And digital circuit designers can work in both positive logic and then negative logic. And in fact, here's a, a, a table that shows that a, a, in one type of logic, positive logic, an OR gate is one thing, but it becomes an AND gate in negative logic. We're not going to go in depth in this. We can't. We don't have the time. But just be aware that positive logic a positive voltage, whatever that reference is, it represents a one. An, in negative logic, a lower voltage represents a one. So here's a, a nice animation that shows an analogy of an OR gate. You have two inputs, A and B, and an output, which is the light. And if switch A is closed, then the light will light. If switch B is closed, the light will light. And if both are closed, the light will light. So um, this is an OR gate. A or B will give you an output. With switches, this is an AND gate. With an AND gate, you must have both A and B in order to get an output. So that's all we're doing here is we're looking at conditions of A or B or A and B. And I mentioned that you know voltage level represents a one and a, a lower voltage maybe represents a zero in positive logic. Well, it's actually not just one fixed voltage, but it's a, it's a range of voltages. Um, and um, you notice though there's a gap between on the left hand side high and low, that little area in there, that's the indeterminate region. You never want your digital signals to be in the indeterminate region because what can happen is that with one IC on your board, it'll interpret that as a one, but you pluck that IC out and put a different one in, it'll determine that to be a zero. So in digital logic, you always want to keep your voltages within normal operating ranges. So we looked at switches as, as far as logical functions. Well, the most basic uh, solid state gate that you can make is using diode logic. 
And here's a simple OR gate that if you put a positive voltage on A, then you'll get a positive output. Or if you put a positive voltage coming in on B, you'll get a positive output. Um, so this is just an OR gate implemented using diodes. And this can actually come in handy. If you have two devices that you want to control a push to talk circuit or some other circuit, you can use diodes to build up a logic gate that will accomplish that for little or no cost. One thing that no matter what family of logic you use, whether it be diodes or switches or whatnot, truth tables are the same no matter what. So for an AND gate or an OR gate uh, or any of the other types, the truth tables will always remain the same. So here's an interesting device. It's an inverter, also known as a NOT gate, where you have a zero on the input, you will always have a one on the output. But if you have a one on the input, you'll always have a zero on the output. And the truth table is off to the right, which shows you there those various conditions. And that's all this device will ever do. So you can utilize this to invert signals in your digital logic design. An OR gate, this is what we saw on the switches, it's where you have A or B being high, then you'll get a high on the output, which is designated here as Q. And you can see it kind of cycling through all of those particular conditions, and you'll see the truth table there off on the right. Now, how do you tr determine whether it's an OR gate or an AND gate? Well, I like to do it this way. If I can open the, okay. So we have OR, and notice the curve part of the letter here. Well, an OR gate has a curve going down here with an output. So that's an OR gate. I might as well take care of it. An AND gate. Notice the straight line, an AND gate is always drawn this way with a straight line here. So OR gate, curve, AND gate, straight. Oh, and we went back. So, whoops, come on. There's an OR gate, that's where we left off. An AND gate, see the straight line there on the left? There, with an AND gate, you have to have A and B to be ones in order to get a one on the output. And the truth table, and these truth tables are the same as the truth tables that are in your book, so you can go back and, and refer to that as well. Here's a little clinker an exclusive OR. In this case, you can have A high and you'll get a high output, or you can have B high and you'll get a high output. But if you have both high, uh -uh, then you get a zero on the output. That's an exclusive OR. And you can see the extra line they have, extra curved line they have there on the start of the gate. And here are some additional logic gate symbols for OR, AND, NOT, the exclusive OR. A NOR gate is simply an OR gate with an inverter on the output. And the inverter is distinguished by that little dot on the output. And a NAND gate, which is essentially an AND gate with an inverter on the output, indicated by the dot. So we talked about diode logic. Well, the first chips that you could buy, which you can't buy anymore, they're, they're obsolete, were diode transistor logic, or DTL. And they used diodes on the input with a transistor on the output side. That was replaced by TTL, or transistor transistor logic, where you have transistors on the AB input and a transistor on the output. You can still buy TTL chips, although they're not so popular uh, anymore. Um, there is an issue. Uh, the TTL uh, devices used a lot of current, 
using bipolar transistors, which are current devices. Um, so there was a fair amount of heat, and you had to have bigger power supplies, especially if you had a, a circuit board with 100 TTL chips on it. You had to provide a lot of current uh, for those, those chips. And there was a limited fan out. You couldn't d drive a number of chips uh, because of the, the single transistor on the output. You could only drive maybe one or two other gates. On either inputs or outputs of devices, remember I talked about that indeterminate voltage level? You never want it to be there. Well, in the absence of an output from another chip, you could provide something called a pull-up resistor. And it's, it's added to the input of your gate. And so if there's no input to the, the chip, this resistor uh, would always have the input of the gate float up toward the supply voltage. That's called a pull-up resistor. Conversely, you could have pull-down resistors as well, if that's your circuit design, so that um, you try to keep the inputs and outputs of your chips from being in that indeterminate state. You use pull-up or pull-down resistors. And later on, they had actually what they called totem pole outputs. That's one transistor on top of another transistor with the output being in the middle. Uh, and that would cause the output of the device to be either actively high at the power supply voltage rail or actively low at ground level. So you never got into an indeterminate state. And again, here's the, the voltage levels and where the uncertain region lies. So TTL chips were largely replaced with CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. And CMOS chips uh, can be um, direct replacements in some cases for TTL chips operating at 5 volts. That was the standard for TTL chips. Also, uh, CMOS can be operated at 10 volts or 12 volts in, in some circuits. You have to look at the specifications. And instead of bipolar transistors, you're using MOSFETs to do the gate functions. Remember, field effect transistors are higher impedance devices, so they less current, less heat, less power supply current requirements. So a lot of good things going on. And by and large, if, you're, if there are logic circuits being developed now, uh, there would be CMOS based. Greater noise margins than uh, transistor, transistor logic. The indeterminate region uh, is different, and the switching threshold is one half of the supply voltage for a CMOS chip. So um, it has greater noise immunity. And then there was a, a combination device called bi CMOS a combination of bipolar and CMOS, where you'd have CMOS devices on the input with a high input impedance, and you'd have a bipolar transistor on the output with high current generating capability, so you could drive more, more chips. <coughs> high input and impedance, low output impedance. Uh, by CMOS are, are used a lot of times for uh, radio frequency oscillator applications. And then there's something called tri-state logic. We're not talking about New York, Connecticut, or New Jersey, however. <coughs> tri-state, uh, and here's a tri-state buffer. This buffer amplifier doesn't change the, the logic state, but it provides maybe some additional amplification or, or, or separation between circuits. But in this case, and you look at the truth table, if A is a 1, then F will be 1 only so long as uh, C is a 1. Uh, the, the C is a clock line or an input control line, and when C goes to zero, the output actually lifts off. It becomes high impedance and lifts off of the line that it was connected to. It disconnects. And by doing this, then you can have many more uh, chips connected to a particular data line without causing interference to others. So this is tri-state tri logic. And you can have a, a buffer, or you can have an inverter, all sorts of different things. And the idea is that um, if, the, the, in this case, the B line is not enabled, then you're not going to even be connected to the output. You used to also be able to um, buy programmable logic devices 
Um, I'm not sure if these are available much anymore, but um, back in the day, uh, you would have a complex array of gates and devices with little fuses inside the device. And through a systematic process of blowing the fuses inside the device, you could create a, a custom gate array. Uh, so you didn't have to you know, build a circuit board with multiple chips. You could do it on one chip by blowing the fuses. Well, it's kind of old fashioned. Nowadays, they have something called field programmable gate arrays, which do the same thing, only at a much greater density. And instead of blowing fuses, which can only be done once, by the way, you actually program these using software. And so, for example, within my flex radio, there's a bunch of field programmable gate arrays inside. And when I get a new software version update, it reprograms the FPGAs to the new requirements. All right, here we have a digital circuit known as a flip-flop. Now, um, here we have some that's built out of two gates. It's got a curve on the front of the gate. So is that an OR or an AND? That's an OR, but it's got a dot on the end. So that's a NOR. So we're using two NOR gates. And this is what they call a bistable circuit. In that if you have a, an input signal that goes high on the R, uh, that's the reset line, then the Q will go low. If you have a high uh, input signal on the S or the set line, then the Q will go high. Uh, so this is a circuit that is a latch or a one-bit memory. You can set it or reset it, and it will remember what you told it to do. So this is a bistable flip-flop. Now there's something called also a JK flip-flop. And there's some debate about why a JK flip-flop is called a JK flip-flop. But the best explanation I've seen comes from the fact that it was named after Jack Kilby, who is an engineer for Texas Instruments, who added something called a clock line to a set reset flip-flop. And what the clock line does is the one-bit memory will only trigger, will only change states as long as the clock line is enabled. And by doing this, you are able to do many, many more functions. One of those things, well, here, first, let's just take a look. As, as the clock pulse comes in, and J and K are considered to be held high, you'll notice that the output Q, or the alternate output, the not Q, uh, they alternate back and forth. Now, for every two pulses that come in on the clock line, only one pulse comes out on the Q line. And so if you have a clock signal coming in at 100 kilohertz, the output on the Q is going to be only 50 kilohertz. And so that's why JK flip-flops can be used as counters. And they can use for binary counting, divide by two. And so one JK flip-flop can divide by two. But if you cascade them, then you can divide by four, divide by eight, divide by 16. So JK flip-flops are used for counter circuits. So here's an A-stable multivibrator. A-stable means it's not stable at all. It's an oscillator. And so what's happening, our signals are going back and forth between these two active devices. And it has two outputs, the Q and the not Q, which are the same, only inverted in phase. And here's an example. If, if the Q and not Q were connected to LEDs, this is an A-stable multivibrator. It's a digital oscillator, essentially. Uh, it's creating digital pulses at a certain rate. Now you can have monostable multivibrators, which has only one stable state. So you have a, a switch that triggers it to have an output pulse. And so here's, a, here's another view of it. You have a trigger input coming in. Notice how that's a little spike. And you have a longer 
constant time output on the output side. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, it was found in digital circuits that sometimes mechanical push-button switches, when you push them, you'll not only get one trigger, but you'll get maybe two. It's called bounce. You have push-button bounce uh, on the input. So this is a debouncing circuit. This will allow, if you, if you push the button once, you'll get a trigger, you'll get an output for a certain period of time, and you only get one. So when you take a picture with your camera, for example, and you push the button, there's probably a circuit like this that is debouncing the mechanical button to make sure that you don't take two pictures. And a bistable multivibrator, uh, it has two stable states. It's direct coupled and it goes back and forth and, oh, that's another name for a flip-flop. It's a bistable multivibrator. Then there are ICs that can count by 10. Uh, and you can actually buy them. Uh, and for every uh, 10 inputs, you'll have one output. So this is how you can count um, in, in the base 10 number system that we use, is by using a decade counter. And here's a, a common uh, 4017B IC. Uh, it has a reset and an enable button, and one clock input, and then 10 output pins. All right. That's all you need to know about digital logic for the test. But there's a wealth of information out there. So you can follow any of the links that are provided there to learn a lot more about digital logic. A lot of digital logic functions have been superseded by microcontrollers and microprocessors. So what do the initial CMOS stand for? Complementary metal oxide semiconductor. You'll also hear it defined as complementary metal oxide silicon. For the purposes of the test, it's semiconductor. And what is tri-state logic? Three. You can have devices with a zero or a one or a high impedance output state. It disconnects from the line. That's a tri-state. And what is the primary advantage of tri-state? If they disconnect from a common output line, then other devices can go online and, and send their signals on that line. So you can connect many device outputs to a common bus line, a common connection. And an advantage of CMOS over TTL? Much lower power consumption. And why do CMOS digital circuits have high immunity to noise? I mentioned that the input switching threshold is about a half of the supply voltage. So that helps it be more immune to noise. And what best describes a pull-up or pull-down resistor? So that you don't get into that indeterminate region, you have a resistor that's either connected to the voltage source or the ground uh, to pull that circuit to whatever you want it to be if there's no active uh, device on the line. All right, get your glasses out. What is the symbol for a NAND gate? Number two, you see that? AND because it's got the straight line, and when the dot on the output makes it a NAND, so number two or B. And what is a programmable logic device? A programmable collection of logic gates and circuits in a single integrated circuit. The old devices you program by blowing fuses. The new devices you program using software. All right, schematic symbol for a NOR gate. So it's an OR gate, so it's curved. And then it's got the dot on the output making a NOR, so it's number four or D. And what is the schematic symbol for the NOT operation? That's an inverter, so that's number five, so that would be C. 
And what is by CMOS logic? You're using both bipolar and CMOS in the same device. So that's a by CMOS. And which of the following is an advantage of by CMOS? Has the high input impedance of CMOS with a low output impedance of bipolar. And what is the primary advantage of using a PGA in a logic circuit? Remember I said before you might have a, a board with you know, maybe 50 uh, TTL gates where you could do it maybe all in one chip with using a programmable gate array. And which is a bistable circuit? Also known as a flip-flop. It's got two stable states. It goes back and forth between them. And what is the function of a decade counter digital IC? It produces one output pulse for ten, every 10 input pulses. It's counting to 10. So which of the following can divide the frequency of a pulse train by two? A spe 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 specifically a JK flip-flop with a clock input. And how many flip-flops are required to divide a signal by four? One JK flip-flop will divide by two, so another one will divide by four, so you need two of those. And which of the following is a circuit that continuously alternates between two states? That is an A-stable or not stable at all multivibrator. It generates its own signal. It's a digital oscillator. And what is the characteristic of a monostable multivibrator? You're debouncing a switch. It switches momentarily to the opposite binary state, then returns. Yep. And what logical operation does a NAND gate perform? You're going to have to think about this a little bit. So it's an AND gate with an inverter. And an AND gate would provide a 1 on the output when all inputs are 1. And that's an AND gate. But when you have an inverter on the output, then it'll produce a logic 0 at its output only when all inputs are logic 1. That's a NAND gate. This will be the hardest part of this section. What logical operation does an OR gate perform? If any or all inputs are 1, then the output will be 1. That's an OR gate. And what logical operation is performed by a two-input exclusive NOR gate? So exclusive OR will provide uh, one on the output if one or the other inputs is a one. But if both are, it won't. So that's an exclusive OR. Well, when an exclusive NOR, there's an inverter on the output. So it'll provide a logic zero at its output only if a single input is at a logic one level. And what is a truth table? A list of all possible inputs and corresponding outputs for a digital logic gate. And what type of logic defines one as a high voltage? Think positive. <laughs> and what type of logic defines zero 
as a high voltage. That would be negative. All right, almost done. Optoelectronics. First time I ever saw an optoelectronic device was at the Montgomery Ward department store in downtown Saginaw, Michigan. I was walking up to the store with my parents and as we got close to the door, all of a sudden the door opened automatically. What? And there was an electric eye and they were so proud of it they had a sign that said, introducing you to the new electric eye automatic door opener. And inside the electric eye was one of these, a, a, a photo resistor, also known as a photo cell, and uh, driving it on the opposite side of the door frame was a, a light source that was pointed at it. And when you stepped in between, you changed the amount of conductivity of the photoresistor by changing the amount of light reaching it. So uh, the photo cell uses the property of photoconductivity. More light makes the device more conductive. Or another way to say it is more light makes the device's resistance go down. So that's an electric eye or, or photo cell. And other photoconductive materials were used in other applications, you know, back when you had to set all the settings on your camera. Uh, I remember my mom had various different kinds of light meters so she could determine what kind of light was in a particular scene. Well, they used selenium photocells uh, and um, a crystalline semiconductor, like we said before, uh, which would generate a, a current when light was shown on it. That's photoconductive materials. I think they may have actually used a battery too to power it. And then opto isolators, these are being used right now in switching power supplies, for example, where you have to have high isolation between the output section of a, a power supply and the 120 volt input section, but you need to provide some feedback uh, between the two. Well, they'll use these optical devices or opto couplers uh, to provide signal transfer between. Um, two parts of the circuit. Now you can also use it to carry uh, data signals and you want to have some isolation. And of course solar panels that uses the photovoltaic effect uh, to convert light to electrical energy, generally using silicon uh, solar cells. And this is an interesting definition, the efficiency of a solar uh, cell is the relative fraction of light that is converted to current. So if you have a dirty photo cell, the efficiency of that photo cell will go down because you're blocking some of the light. So that's one way to improve efficiency is just to keep them clean. Uh, each solar cell in a um, solar system uh, puts out about half a volt and you have a bunch of these in series. Uh, to make up the, the output voltage of a, a solar panel. And again, we're looking at the outer valence electrons in, in the silicon. Uh, photons coming in will shift them into a higher state, and that's used to generate uh, the voltage. All right, moving on. Your radio, back in the day, would probably have a big tuning knob connected by dial cord connected to a variable capacitor. Nowadays, you're going to have a tuning knob that's connected to an optical shaft encoder. And by turning that encoder, you're generating digital signals, digital pulses, that control the digital frequency synthesizer inside your radio. So that's an optical shaft encoder, also known as a rotary encoder, where you have a pattern uh, that's inside the device that, that as you turn it, uh, sensors read that and generate digital pulses. An optical device. Another uh, optical device is a solid state relay, which may have an opto isolator built in. Uh, solid state relays replace mechanical relays for switching functions. And um, a, a lot of um, old linear amplifiers, I'm thinking of Kenwood, for example, they used 120 volts on the uh, switching line to switch from transmit to receive. And old Kenwood radios were able to handle that. 
but nowadays modern radios wouldn't, so you have to provide some sort of interface between your radio and these older amplifiers, and a solid state relay would uh, do that just fine. Uh, by controlling a small voltage on the, the control side, you can control a large voltage on the, on the other side. Oh, questions. So what is photoconductivity? Photoconductivity. The increased conductivity of an illuminated semiconductor. It's more conductive or its resistance is less when you have light on it. That's the electric eye. And what happens to the conductivity of a photoconductive material when light shines on it? The conductivity increases. And what is the most common configuration of an optoisolator or optocoupler? There's a LED that is illuminated by an input uh, signal and a phototransistor to read that um, over a barrier so that the input and output side of it are isolated from one another by the light. And what is the photovoltaic effect? The conversion of light to electrical energy. And which describes an optical shaft encoder? You have to have a patterned wheel, and you can use it to detect rotation. And which of these materials is affected the most by photoconductivity? We want a crystalline semiconductor. That's the, the thing that's going to be impacted. And what is a solid state relay? You're using all solid state uh, semiconductors to implement the functions of what was previously an electromechanical relay. And why are optocouplers often used in conjunction with solid state circuits when switching 120 volts AC? Electrical isolation. Isolation, absolutely. Opto uh, isolators provide very high degree of electrical isolation. And what is the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell? It has to do with the relative fraction of light that is converted to current, which is why you want to keep your solar panels clean. And what is the most common type of photovoltaic cell used for power generation? Silicon. Silicon. And which of the following is the approximate open circuit voltage produced by a fully illuminated photovoltaic cell? 0.5 volts and many cells in series make up a panel. And what absorbs the energy from light falling on a photovoltaic cell? Electrons are moved to a higher orbit energy level. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of Chapter 5. You did great. We're out even a little bit early. Thank you so much.